Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is chapter 13. We're going to be discussing uh, the microbe human interaction and mostly talking about disease here. So let's just kick right into gear. These are our learning outcomes for this chapter. Again, you can always revisit these on the slides available on Canvas. So we know that the human body is host to a whole bunch of microbes, and we know it could include um, uh, bacteria, it can include uh, protozoa, <laughs> sorry, my brain is losing it, um, protozoa, and it can even include viruses as part of like uh, the normal biome. Oh, and fungi, of course, of course, like yeast. So um, the, all of these can, you know, colonize our, our bodies, whether it's on the outside surface or within um, our bodies somewhere. So that holobiont, that is referring to the human with all of the resident biota all together to meet. That's, I guess, the human, because we have to have those things for the most part. But, you know, they made a word for it, holobiont. So be aware of that term. All right, infection refers to any condition where we have pathogenic organisms um, causing uh, penetrating the host's defenses and multiplying in the tissues. And then we have the disease, meaning that pathological state that result, resolves, um, results that um, is referring to a deviation from health, typically in a negative way, right? So those are those two terms. Be aware of the definition for those because there's not just infectious causes for disease, right? We know that they can't, disease obviously can be caused by infection, but we can have um, problems with genetics, genetic abnormalities. We can have issues due to aging and we can have malfunctions of systems or organs. Even if we're talking about um, having cancer that had developed due to radiation exposure. That could be um, a disease, but it's not infectious. Infectious disease um, refers to the disruption of those tissues or organs, causing that deviation for, from health due to the presence of microbes and infection. So resident biota, the normal biota, is just the diverse uh, microbes that are living on the outside, which we were just talking about. That includes uh, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses. So all four of those um, are included within the biota of people or the holobiont or whatever that was. Um, that was the term for it. So as far as what's going to happen with disease, this is our holobiont, our person that has uh, their, their biome. I need a marker. There we go, holobiont. And then um, how they might, you know, uh, contract infection and they might lead to disease. So we might have uh, potential pathogens and just normal transient bacteria that we might be exposed to in our lives. This can include like some people have staph, for example, growing on their skin normally. People can have streptococcus pneumoniae, which is the major cause of pneumonia as part of their normal respiratory biome as well. Um, however, it doesn't always cause infection which would be growth in tissues um, in a way that it shouldn't be growing. So too much of it, overgrowth, and it's, uh, you know, overstaying its welcome in a way, um, inviting too many friends over in a way, and setting up shop uh, in, uh, in other areas where it didn't ever belong. So migrating, like we had talked about with E. coli, um, causing uh, urinary tract infections. So we have establishment of the disease, um, due to infection. Um, this could be from biome um, pathogens that decide to get out of control for whatever reason. We have a shift in that biome, and now we do have overgrowth with those pathogens. That's an endogenous disease. Um, but yeah, th there's all sorts of, of, of these other scenarios where, you know, occasionally uh, coming into contact with uh, microbes outside of our biota or uh, microbes that are part of um, that would be introduced, reintroduced, that were pathogenic, reintroduced as part of our um, biome, pre incorporated into the whole biome, biont after you fight off the disease. So maybe you harbor staff now after you had your infection with it, um, and now it's part of your normal biome. That's an example. So anytime, uh, so some of the preliminary results from the Human Microbiome Project and trying to look at the you know um, extent that our gut biome, uh, or not just our gut biome, I guess our whole biome, but a lot of these products were primarily looking at our gut microbiome and the effects that it has on our health outside of infection necessarily. So we've noticed that the composition of the host microbiome impacts the success of viral infections 
including uh, HIV or influenza. So your makeup of your normal biome can affect how easily you'll be infected by these things. The gut microbiome can influence many aspects of human health, including, for example, mental health. It's been very closely linked with um, schizophrenia and probably bipolar disorder and depression as well. And the human microbiome um, influences effectiveness of cancer treatments and other treat drug treatments um, based on how those bacteria react to the drug can affect its uh, effect, its effectiveness on the person receiving the drug. So here are some uh, locations on the body where we have a normal microbiome associated. We already knew most of these did. We know that the vagina and external genitalia, the upper respiratory tract, um, skin, that these had normal biomes, right? So these guys, we knew they had a biome associated with them. These guys, we have found DNA associated in these areas um, recently. So the lungs, the lower respiratory tract here and the placenta amniotic fluid and the fetus. So the fetus actually growing in the uterus, there is um, bacteria associated in that environment that could be uh, leading to the development of the normal biome for that fetus. So, um, and we did, we have found DNA from microbiota um, in these areas in the brain and in the bloodstream, which we think should be a sterile area, but it hasn't been proven that they're actually flourishing in those areas. How do we get our biota? Um, well, we already know the, be the benefits of the biota, right? Um, it's going to influence the development of our organs. It's going to prevent overgrowth of harmful microorganisms, uh, and it's going to allow to protect us um, using uh, microbial antagonism where the uh, good microbes have effects against the intruder microbes, whether it's by taking up the stadium seeds or by defending with you know, toxins or something like that. So microbes in a steady established relationship are unlikely to be displaced by those incoming microbes. That means that they've already staked out and sat down in those stadium seats and they ain't moving. So that's the idea there. Factors that weaken host defenses and increase susceptibility to infection, obviously age, getting older, um, lowered immune, immunity due to that, genetic defects that lead to issues with uh, immune, the immune system, then we have acquired defects. Um, like from a disease that has caused immune problems like HIV. Uh, pregnancy, surgery, organ transplant is very stressful on the body, both of these things. Um, underlying diseases can you know, compromise your immune strength. The chemotherapy and immunosuppressive drugs, that's what they do is lower your immune system's ability to fight. It's not just going to be for the thing like rheumatoid arthritis. It's going to be for all your immune system because they can't target it specifically like that. So it lowers the whole thing. And then we have physical and mental stress and um, other infections, of course. So all of that stressful stuff can lead to a weakened immune system that can cause disease. So endogenous infections are infections that are caused by biota that are already in the body and they can occur when normal biome um, is introduced into a site that was previously sterile. The example here, Streptococcus pneumoniae carried as normal biota will cause pneumococcal pneumonia um, in AIDS patients um, you know, whenever it's allowed to, to migrate and uh, populate the respiratory system in those people who have a weakened immune system. So much more so in them than in somebody who had a strong immune system. So we believe that we get our microbiome from as early as the fetus. So within the womb, so it starts there and exposure continues whenever we're born, whether it's vaginal or C-section, it doesn't matter. Exposure to the bacteria um, in the outside environment uh, will, will lead to development of your biota. The breast milk also contains bacteria. So um, those bacteria digest sugars that we can't. Um, so they help populate our gut with those bacteria that would digest those sugars. And the, the so those are going to be healthy gut by bacteria typically. And so we need a breast milk to maintain a healthy gut biome for babies. Now you can supplement with formula that has um, prebiotics and probiotics um, in order to grow up a healthy biome for your baby in case you can't breastfeed, so don't worry. So this is just going over essentially um, how you would get exposed to your microbiome and get it established in part of your body. So these are examples of microorganisms where they would be found and what would be found in what areas. Um, I'm not gonna go through these, but hey, here they are. If you guys want to look through these, these are um, examples for each system. 
So a pathogen is a microbe with uh, a re relationship that is parasitic with the host that results in infection and disease. So we establish infection, which is growing within a tissue and then um, causing disease, which is a deviation from health. So true pathogens are capable of causing disease even in healthy people, whereas opportunistic pathogens cause disease when the defenses of the host are compromised somehow. So that lowered weakened immune system, right? Or introduced into parts of the body where they shouldn't be, like with E. coli and urinary tract infections. This leads us to the concept of biosafety level. Why does it lead to this concept? Well, it happens to be that um, how dangerous a microbe is with regard to its ability to cause infection, cause disease, and pathogenicity, that we can rank them and put them into certain categories uh, based on that pathogenicity, right? So biosafety level one, standard area, this is anything that we have been handling in our um, lab in you know, our unknown stuff. And then level, biosafety level two, we start to have actual pathogens associated, but they are pathogens that can be maintained um, in an open environment um, and can be handled at, uh, de at a bench top. But we would just maybe have um, gloves and we would want to have, uh, uh, say, robes, lab coats, <laughs> and, and um, uh, just be sure that the you have a procedure with cleaning off the countertops and all that and maintaining cleanliness. Biosafety level three, we have uh, some significantly more dangerous diseases that might be harder to keep clean, get rid of, um, and cause pathogenicity uh, that could be deadly within people. So here we're talking about tuberculosis, um, uh, the black plague, and um, coccidioides imidis, which causes um, fungal uh, meningitis. Next is the biosafety level four. So this is going to be, so right, let's go back to biosafety level three. For the people that are handling these organisms, this is a situation where you might have um, disposable gowns, disposable shoe covers, so you're not taking anything with you out of the area. There might be a pressure system. I know there is in a lot of tuberculosis labs um, where they have a negative pressure in the room and air would rush in anytime that a door is opened or something like that, so that if um, something were to become uh, exposed to the air, it wouldn't get out into the building surrounding. So there is that going on. So they will wear face masks um, to pr protect themselves. But other than that, they're pretty much open to the environment. Um, so there is more safety involved there with the biosafety level four now. This is significant pathogens. Here we're talking about Ebola. These are things that are going to cause very severe disease and are potentially seriously contagious when handled in a laboratory setting or even in the wild, just depending on what you're talking about. So this is Ebola. This is um, uh, Marburg, um, some of our more exotic viruses and stuff um, like arena viruses. That's going to include loss of fever, which is also a hemorrhagic fever virus. So any of those hemorrhagic fever viruses that you really don't want to get, a lot of those are going to be in the BSL-4 category, depending on how communicable they are. So um, here you will be wearing the suit, which is positive pressure. So air is like pushing out. Um, the room will be negative pressure so that if you get a tear in your suit, the air rushes out of your suit and you don't get contamination from of the outside in. And then the room itself being negative pressure, if it were you know, to be compromised, the air would rush in from outside of, uh, of that room. They often have uh, hot chemical showers that they will walk into and through um, to get into and out of these suites where they will handle everything. Um, the whole suit is sealed up. It is a um, completely sealed suit. Uh, there's air supply going into it that you will hook into, but um, other than that, I mean, you have like rubber gloves and stuff on and that's going to be shielding you completely from any exposure to these pathogens to keep you safe. Most of you guys have seen that example of that. All right, virulence is the term referring to the degree of the pathogenicity, how bad it makes you sick, okay? This is um, gonna be uh, indicated by that microbe's ability to establish itself in the host as well as cause damage within the host. A virulence factor is anything that allows that microbe to cause virulence. So anything that allows it to cause a pathogenic response of some kind. So if it contributes to that, it's a virulence factor like capsules, like production of toxins. So an infectious dose is the number of minimum number of microbes required to um, cause an infection in a host. So this is different for each microbe and it's determined experimentally typically for each microbe. Um, microbes with a smaller infectious dose 
have a greater virulence. Um, that means if it only takes one microbe to cause a, a disease in somebody versus you know 100 microbes to cause the disease, um, then the one with the one microbe to cause disease is more virulent. That's what that's saying. All right, so variability of host. Uh, this just is going to depend. Can can a host um, um, basically deal deal with this microbe and get um, infected with this microbe? Is what I'm trying to say. So the host's genetics has a, something to play here as far as the pathogenicity of the organism um, that is infecting. So your genetics, uh, your response of your body against that microbe and how much uh, your immune system is going to be causing inflammation. That's often where a lot of our discomfort comes from illness uh, and our uh, defense systems in general. So the genetics are gonna be determining factor there. And then we have exposures to particular microbe. It just depends on the microbe is what it's saying. And then the overall health of the host. These are gonna be things that are going to be um, factors to consider whether or not a microbe can uh, cause and establish an infection and therefore um, a disease essentially. So polymicrobial infections are just what they sound like. That means that you have more than one organism associated in that infection or your immune system is weakened due to the first infection and now a second microbe can get involved. So influenza is a viral infection. Oftentimes you, when you get influenza, we can have introduction of uh, bacteria that can cause pneumonia. So there's a, a virus and a bacteria going on there and that flu would make you more susceptible to that. So as far as um, when, how we would cause disease in hosts, we want to find a way in. We want to attach to the host. We want to survive the defenses of the host. We want to, uh, well, we don't want to, but we will end up causing disease somehow or damage to the host. And then, uh, then we'll need to exit the host um, to be able to move on to the next person if we're a pathogen. That's kind of the whole goal. That's spreading yourself everywhere, trying to you know take over the world. So um, our portals of entry, this is just determining how you would get into a person's body. It's usually the skin or the mucous membranes. Um, but our uh, source of our agent could be exogenous from the outside of us, or which we'll talk about how that would happen in a second, or endogenous, um, which would be uh, existing on the body already, which you know we already talked about. Um, that that can be common having pathogen living on your body as normal as your normal biome. So as far as exogenous goes, it can come from the environment, another person or an animal, and the way that it would get into the body would be through nicks or abrasions in the skin or or even punctures. Um, like if you were getting a vaccine or you stepped on a nail or something like that. Intact skin is tough. Most microbes aren't going to be able to just penetrate that intact skin. So some infectious agents do have um, digestive enzymes that can help them break in through the skin so they can establish infection that way. We can get in through the gastrointestinal tract as well, through food or drink or other ingested substances. The, um, these microbes that are going to cause infection that way, they have to be adapted to survive in the digestive um, enzymes and the very low acidic pH of the stomach, right? So to be able to uh, survive that, a lot of bacteria can't. So gateways into the respiratory tract, if you're going to be getting infected through the respiratory tract, this is going to be the oral cavity and the nasal cavity, literally just breathing in, right? So um, mucous membranes in those areas are going to be susceptible um, when exposed to microbes. And we can also often transfer microbes from one site to another. So from one side of the respiratory tree to the other. Um, and then how far or how deep it can go into the respiratory tree depends on the microbe. It also depends on um, you know, uh, what, you know, whether it can be carried super deep into the respiratory tract. Okay. So small cells and particles are going to be inhaled more deeply than the large ones. So they can establish a deeper infection lower down in the respiratory tract. Makes sense. Especially whenever um, we're, ta we're talking about respiratory viruses, you know, um, anyways. So you can also get in through the urogenital portals. This is going to be sexually transmitted diseases. Typically um, here, there are um, pathogens that will be transmitted due to having sexual intercourse. They account for about 4% of infections worldwide. Uh, entry points would include any um, skin or mucosa, um, often due to abrasion or micro tears or whatever else. So this includes um, the external genitalia. We have the penis and the vagina, the cervix and the urethra all can be ports of entry um, due to exposure to you know, path potential pathogens. 
So during birth, we have the placenta as an exchange organ. Um, this is, you, you know, connects the mother and the fetus. That's what it's there for. So it separates the blood of the developing fetus from the mother, but allows for diffusion between the two um, as needed. So there are a few microbes that can cause that barrier. So um, I say a few, but it's, it's a shocking amount, unfortunately. Um, and then other infections will be transmitted perinatally as the child is born and exposed to. So here we're talking about typically herpes virus that causes severe, severe um, health issues with infants. So this is just depicting um, that barrier and how that would work with the mother and the fetus um, in utero. So diseases that are associated typically with uh, the fetus and the neonate that could be uh, being born. Here we have toxoplasmosis, it's a um, uh, protozoan disease uh, transmitted through handling um, cat litter, dirty cat litter. Then we have other diseases like syphilis, Coxsackie virus, um, varicella zoster, um, AIDS and chlamydia, all of these can be associated with this, as well as rubella, which can be deadly to fetus, and cytomegalovirus, which is extremely dangerous to fetuses as well. And then, of course, like we were just saying, herpes simplex virus. It is no joke. We're talking about anywhere from like 30 up to 80% mortality rate on exposure to herpes virus um, during birth. So it's not a, not a joke. So most serious complications um, are going to be uh, spontaneous abortion, extremely serious, congenital abnormalities, that's going to last forever, brain damage, premature birth, and then stillbirth. All right, next we have attachment to the host. We've gotten in, so now how do we stick and stay there where we want to be? So adhesion is referring to the process where um, microbes will gain a stable foothold on host tissues, and it depends on binding between specific molecules on the host cells and the, the not bacteria necessarily, the pathogens um, external uh, makeup. So uh, those glycoproteins that we've talked about that um, tend to be like our key to get into the lock so they can get inside of the cell, right? Or get into the tissue or adhere to it. Um, so a particular pathogen is limited only to cells that it can bind to. This can make a pathogen very specific to a specific tissue and specific organism, or it can make it very generalized. It just depends on the pathogen that we are talking about. For example, rabies, uh, rabies virus, can um, infect any mammalian tissue. There you go. <laughs> so that's a pretty broad range. Whereas we have some viruses that might infect, you know, like uh, only the liver, um, the liver cells of only people, um, so, or only primates. So there's examples there. So quorum sensing. Here we are talking about. Uh, you know, bacteria creating a biofilm and then talking with one another to make sure that everything's going good in that biofilm or within a, establishing an infection when if we are attaching to surfaces and trying to establish an infection. So we can actually talk and send, send signals to each other in certain cir circumstances to allow us to let each other know that things are good and going well. So how can we adhere? We have the fimbriae. These are found on bacteria. Um, they're little e extensions hair-like um, extensions off the cell that just, that's for adherence. That's what that's for. Then we also have capsules, which are sticky outside coating, right? Our virulence factor that we keep talking about allows for evasion of phagocytosis, also allows for adherence to target cells. And then we have viruses that actually dock, like uh, you dock with host cells using their glycoprotein. So just sugar plus protein, their sugar plus protein interacts with our host cell sugar plus protein and the key fits into the lock. And then when it does, it triggers the cell to engulf it or take it up and go forth with whatever the next process would be to break it down and release the genome, um, which we learned about in the vir viral virus chapter. <laughs> Um, so here are some examples of some adhesive properties of certain microbes that we're not going to get into the details of, but those are the traits that they have to allow them to adhere. So next we have surviving the host defenses. We adhered, we entered um, through our little portal, we adhered to our surface, and now we have to survive the defense. The host is going to start fighting you off pretty quickly. So that's going to include our white blood cells that are going to undergo phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is just eating up of stuff from the environment. It could just be broken down um, cells like dead cells or debris or something like that. 
but it will also eat up pathogens. So it's a large, um, large grabbing up of um, stuff outside of the cell. That's phagocytosis. So some organisms have antiphagocytic factors that allow them to um, survive the host defense. So that would be considered a virulence factor if it can, uh, if it has something that allows it to evade phagocytosis and therefore establish infection and pathogenicity, right? This can include killing the phagocyte itself with whatever toxins that that organism produces, but it could also evade it, you, um, making it difficult to, for the phagocyte to engulf them, which we've talked about with the capsules. Um, and then some of them can even survive inside of the phagocytes. That's going to include um, bac uh, bacteria, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycobacterium lives inside of alveolar macrophages. Macrophages are phagocytic cells. Um, and so uh, they'll get eaten up by those cells and they are perfectly happy to stay there. That's pretty much where they want to be. So that's where they will live and be happy and fortunate for us when we're trying to fight it off. Next, we have um, uh, epigenetic mechanisms by which that these organisms can um, survive our host defenses, right? So these are changes to DNA that affect the way that is transcribed but it's not an actual mutation in the sequence. So we're just making a different um, product or something. Um, uh, we're, we're causing the I say different products. So we're shutting down the host's systems um, so that we can utilize everything and hijack everything um, using these epigenetic uh, mechanisms to control um, the host's functioning. So there's a lot of ways that um, organisms can do that, especially viruses, but we're not going to get into that right this second. We did talk about that um, a little bit in the virus chapter, but we'll talk about it again in the different diseases. So now actually causing the disease itself, we have virulence factors. This includes structures, products, and capabilities that allow pathogens to cause infection in the host. We've said this a million times. So it is anything that allows the pathogen to be pathogenic, right? Cause bad symptoms. So these um, allow the organism typically to survive in the host. That's why they're there. And it just causes um, more pathogenicity or problems, um, damage for us. So this could be secreting proteins, which would include um, enzymes or toxins, anything that would, could cause damage or death to cells, to the host cells, our cells. Um, they could cause an overreaction from the body's defenses. And because uh, the, they're triggering too much of a reaction from the body's defense, um, the defenses um, will cause host damage. So um, that's not necessarily intentional on the organism's part, but that is a, what can happen as part of the pathogenic process for some organisms. Doesn't necessarily help it, but uh, it does cause more pathogenicity, right? More bad symptoms. So altering the host cell genome or the transcription process is sort of similar to what we were talking about, where that's becoming um, latent, becoming a provirus and inserting yourself in the genome of the host. Um, it could be that, or it could be um, other epigenetic things that to control the host cells abilities. So um, if we are causing damage via enzymes, exoenzymes are the ones that we are secreting, so pushing out of the cell. Um, these are secreted by bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and worms. So those four can um, be involved in secreting exoenzymes to break down and inflict damage on the tissues of the host. They dissolve the host's defense barriers. They promote the spread of the microbe into deeper tissues so that they can continue multiplying. Some examples include um, mucinase, um, keratinase, and hyaluronidase. So keratinase, um, kerat Keratinase, keratinase, that's how I say, I don't know what I pronounce these things, but I can recognize the word. I know what they mean. Keratin is the waterproof coating on the skin that protects us um, and from things getting into our skin and protects our skin itself. These organisms that have keratinase, they have an enzyme that breaks down keratin and allows them to get in through the skin potentially um, and cause infection that way. So that's an example. Next, we have toxins. These are chemical products made by microbes, plants, and some animals that are poisonous to other organisms. So that's a toxin. An exotoxin is secreted by living cells, um, and that's going to be um, affecting the infected tissues that that bacteria is living in. So they're secreting it into those tissues. That's what I'm saying. So there's a lot of different exotoxins that bacteria can make. 
There's also endotoxin. But remember, endotoxin is going to be associated with gram negative bacteria exclusively. And it is associated with lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide is in the outer membrane of gram negative bacteria. And this is not secreted or anything. It's just part of the outer membrane. That's endotoxin, gram negative only. Here are some comparisons between exotoxins and endotoxins, if you would like to make a comparison between those two. So here we are looking at um, hemolysis, which is the breaking down of red blood cells uh, by different bacteria on blood auger. If we have a clearing around the growth, that is known as a beta hemolysis. And if it's turned greenish, but it isn't really a clearing, then that is alpha hemolysis. And then if we have gamma, that means there's no hemolysis. I don't know why it's called gamma hemolysis, but that means no visible hemolysis. That's an H, by the way. Okay, so those are the different kinds of hemolysis that you can see, and you do need to be aware of the difference, different kinds of hemolysis, by the way. So uh, next we have inducing the uh, excessive host response. We kind of brought that up a little bit, but it can, um, you know, most organisms do it accidentally, just associated with that specific pathogen, but they triggered that host response and it just is an overreaction um, and uh, it causes a lot of damage to our own tissues because we're having an overreaction of these inflammatory responses. And then due to that, we have... Um, the damage in our own tissues from ourselves, from our own immune system's response. Um, so that's kind of a bad deal. And that's where we get the symptoms from in those cases. So uh, pathogenicity in this case, we can see clearly that in with that story that I just told you, um, pathogenicity is a trait not solely determined by the microorganisms, but also by the interplay between the microbe and the host. In other words, in this case, um, our immune system overreacting to something, right? So um, uh, here's an example. Scientists speculate that the symptoms of long haul COVID, we call it long COVID, persisting for months in certain people um, are caused by overstimulated immune response. So the symptoms are just due to uh, their bodies still overreacting to having had the virus at all. The virus could even potentially be cleared by the, at that point but um, the immune system is still overreacting because of it. So um, here we have those epigenetic changes in the host cells. Again, um, we would uh, affect the host um, DNA functions uh, by, by binding to the host cell histones that just dealing with um, the proteins involved in the DNA structure, uh, binding the small RNAs uh, that are used for silencing of genes um, and then binding to chromatin itself. All of these are ways that microbes can control our um, gene expression. That's epigenetic. So here are some examples of some patterns of infection. And we're gonna go through each of these. I'm just gonna push on. So localized infection, the body, um, the microbe will enter the body at specific locations and stay localized to those locations. This includes an example, boils. Next, we have systemic infections. Um, this is when an infection spreads to several sites uh, and body, to, body tissue fluids, and um, often usually the bloodstream as well. So that would be septicemia when we have a flourishing in a bacterial infection in the blood. So viral um, versions of these, we could have measles, rubella, chickenpox, and AIDS. Bacteria could be brucellosis, anthrax, typhoid fever, syphilis, uh, and then fungal could be you know, cryptococcus, uh, cryptococcus and then histoplasmosis. Um, both of those would probably take a lowered immune system to have that sort of effect, but that would affect the whole system is what this is talking about. Infectious agents can also travel by the means of ner uh, the nerves, which includes rabies. You get bitten somewhere on your body. The virus multiplies in that area and then travels up through the nerves into um, the brain and then into the salivary glands as well. Um, and that's why it is transmitted through saliva. All right, and then we have a cerebrospinal fluid that infectious diseases can have, or in the case of meningitis, which is caused by a lot of different things because it's a syndrome. All right, focal infection. This is whenever we have an infectious agent that breaks loose from a local infection and is carried to other tissues, okay? So it is still from the local area, but it has spread to maybe one other area. 
So this could include tuberculosis, and that can spread from the lungs into other areas of the body. Um, pharyngitis, that's streptococcus, that strep throat, that can lead to the development of scarlet fever, which we know. And then toxemia, um, infectious um, infection itself it remains localized. The bacteria didn't spread anywhere, but the toxins that they are making can be carried through the blood to other areas and then cause damage. So then we have mixed infections. This is where we have several agents establishing themselves simultaneously at a site. So this, these are those polymicrobial diseases. Um, this often includes things like gas gangrene and other wound infections all at the same time. Uh, human bite infections. Usually if you bite somebody, you've got so much bacteria that you're causing infection with all the different kinds of bacteria in that area. Then we also have primary and secondary infections. The primary infection is that initial infection. The secondary infection occurs whenever you have um, uh, another infection starting um, due to that maybe weakened system um, caused by the first infection. So they're kind of piggybacking on what's happening. So um, here we have our primary urinary tract infection leading to a secondary vaginal infection associated with that. Okay, so we have acute versus chronic infections, um, right? Acute comes on rapidly and usually is short-lived. Chronic infections persist for a long time. And this is relative, of course, depending on the disease. This also brings us back to signs, symptoms, and syndromes. A sign is anything where we have evidence that we can um, uh, basically measure. It's not just uh, word of mouth. So if we talk about someone's pain, that would be a symptom. We can't measure that outside of them, right? They know they're in pain. We can't even see that. We can't measure that. We can't palpate that. We can't you know, do anything with that. So those are symptoms, uh, whereas a sign would be something like um, your fever. So you can actually look at the temperature and know that there's a fever. So, right. So a syndrome, syndrome is a term referring to disease that is identified or defined by certain complex of signs and symptoms. And you're like, probably like, oh, what, what is this? What is this? What is a syndrome? Meningitis. We just talked about that one, right? So the, the symptoms that are associated with meningitis, with the stiff neck, with the headache, with light sensitivity, with potentially a fever, right? Um, that That is associated with meningitis, but there are all these different bacteria, viruses, even fungi that can cause meningitis. And so that is a syndrome. They all cause those same symptoms. They're all linked together. So here are some examples of signs, fever that we can measure, septicemia, we can actually test for that, um, which is growth and flourishing of bacteria in the bloodstream, right? Microbes in tissue fluids um, and, and whatever. You can see all of these are measurable things. Whereas symptoms here, we're talking about uh, kind of the patient says that um, they're experiencing these things, but we're not really sure. So if they're nauseous, I don't know, but you can see um, vomiting, you know, for sure. Nausea is harder to, it's less tangible, right? Their throat hurts. Well, you can't actually see the throat hurting. You can only see the inflammation in the throat. That's a different thing than the pain associated. Fatigue, being tired, how do you measure that? So this is exactly what we're talking about. Measurable signs not measurable symptoms, both equally important though. All right, so we have inflammation uh, referring to, this is one of the earliest symptoms of disease. Um, we can have associated with inflammation, edema, which is accumulation of fluid. And what exactly does that mean? It's fluid from the bloodstream that is meant to be transporting immune responses and uh, immune chemicals, immune cells, whatever, but it is involved in, um, you know, you know, uh, so replying, responding, that's the word, responding to um, this you know, bad invader or whatever it is. Could even just be you scraped your knee. So there's damage being caused. Anytime there's damage at all being done to your body, whether it's infectious or otherwise, then you have the inflammatory response, right? That's just how your body automatically reacts and it is protective. So edema is part of that. That helps bring things to that area that can help um, deal with healing as well as clearing out any potential infection. Then we have granulomas and abscesses. They, these are the formation of white blood cells essentially coming around an area to wall it off to prevent it from spreading as well as to kill off hopefully any microbes, any pathogens in those areas. And then we have lymphadenitis. lymphadenitis. This is just swollen lymph nodes, just a word for that. There's also signs of infection in the blood that we can talk about that are measurable. Um, first. Um, leukocytosis, we have an increased white blood cell count, and leukopenia is decreased white blood cell count. 
Septicemia, the um, general state in which microbes are multiplying in the blood in large numbers. They are flourishing there. Microbes are flourishing in the blood. That is septicemia. Bacteremia, we have some bacteria in the blood where there should not be any at all, by the way. There are some bacteria in the blood that are present, but they're not necessarily multiplying yet. And then we have viremia, which is the presence of viruses in the blood and whether or not they're multiplying or not, they sh also shouldn't be there. Then we have um, infections that go unnoticed, right? So these are asymptomatic, subclinical, or inapparent. So we just don't know that this person is ill. And they might not know either. The host could be infected, but doesn't manifest the disease, the symptoms associated with it, just their body is different than yours and how it responds to things. Uh, the patient experiences no symptoms or disease and just doesn't seek medical attention and therefore cannot get um, diagnosed. And we can't, you know, say, oh, this person had, you know, COVID. This person had no, you know, symptoms or signs associated with COVID. Um, so why would they go into the clinic? So most infections are attended by some sort of sign of some kind. Usually you're feeling ill in some way due to infection. Next, after we've caused our disease, we need to get out of the host so we can go spread to another host because we're trying to take over the world. So our portal of exit for our pathogens to get out of our body can include secretion, excretion, discharge, sloughed tissue. This is just showing that insects can draw our blood and then take that to somebody else. Um, feces, urine, removing the blood itself by, um, you know, a phlebotomy of some kind, and then um, skin cells, open lesions, coughing and sneezing are all ways that they can get out. So escaping um, from respiratory and the salivary tract, we are talking about mucus itself having the organism in it, the sputum, nasal drainage, and other moist secretions. Do not forget the saliva in the case of rabies. So skin scales are um, outer layer of skin and scalp that are just constantly shed. Um, and household dust is often consisting of that. So a single person can shed several billion cells a day. That's one way that organisms can get off of your body is through those shed cells. We also have a fecal exit, which is exactly what it sounds like, a motility of the bowel uh, trans transmitting you know, your way out of the host um, via their feces. So this resulting diarrhea is, diarrhea is usually associated if this is your mode of exit, not always, but it can be. Um, diarrhea provides an exit a rapid exit, I guess, for a pathogen. This is also common with helminths and worms that release their eggs and cysts through feces. Um, feces containing pathogens are a public health problem, of course, and we want to um, monitor for that. Then we have the urogenital tract and how it's going to be uh, transmitted out of there. Um, could be vaginal discharge, could be semen, could be micro tears, could be um, transit through the birth canal itself, right? And um, pathogens that affect the kidney are often discharged in the urine. So whether you got that infection from the urinary tract or not, if you have an infection in your kidneys, they'll get shed in your urine. It can be transmitted that way. So removal of blood is another way we can get out. Here we have um, just you know taking out blood for from vascular puncture for whatever reason, or blood feeding animals like ticks and mosquitoes. Long-term um, infections and effects of those infections. So latency, this is a dormant state, dormant state of an infectious disease where typically the disease, either the organism itself is hiding out or it has established its genome within the host genome and is just waiting out things. So it just depends. Uh, this is going to um, be tuberculosis, syphilis. It can include typhoid fever where it can hide out in certain parts of the GI tract without much symptoms. Um, so it's just waiting for recurrence of the disease or the ability to spread to the next host. Um, sequelae is talking about um, long-term or permanent damage to organs and tissues of the host. Um, meningitis can result in deafness, for example, and then that's going to be forever. Even when you don't have that organism that caused meningitis, you can still have the deafness that was caused. And of course, we know polio can cause uh, permanent paralysis. We've seen that with FDR. So after talking about the course of infection, the incubation period is the time from the initial contact with the infectious agent to the appearance of the first symptoms. Basically, a short period of time where the microbes are um, multiplying and the body hasn't maybe seen it yet and started reacting to it yet. 
that all of that has to happen in order for us to usually see symptoms. Next, we have the prodromal phase. This is whenever the earliest symptoms show up. So that's prodromal. The acute phase, this is whenever we have the greatest virulence and the most um, pathogenicity developing. And then we have the convalescent stage where we have a decline in the symptoms. Most of us will still be um, contagious during the convalescent stage as we are clearing out the infection. That is no surprise, I'm sure, but I'm sure that you also will be going back to school or work when you start feeling just a little bit better because you need to go back to these things and then you are contagious to other people. So this is that uh, a graphical depiction of what I just told you. So here's that if you need to see that, it's nice. All right, next we have reservoirs and sources and all of these things. A reservoir, um, this is anywhere in the natural world where a pathogen exists naturally. So where you would normally find it. Um, this can be a human or an animal um, that would be a carrier of this disease and also can include soil, water, plants. You know, there's a lot of these areas um, in the world that you can get sick from these things. So those are the reservoirs and the source is not the same thing as a reservoir. It's distinct, this source of an outbreak, okay? This is um, an individual or an object from which that infection was acquired. Okay, that was the source for that infection. A carrier is somebody who inconspicuously shelters a pathogen and can spread it without um, knowing that they're spreading it, like typhoid Mary, um, typhoid Mary, Mary Mallon, she was a cook and um, she had typhoid fever and she didn't have any symptoms. And so she was spreading typhoid fever because she wasn't washing her hands. And so they locked her up and said, no, no, you can't be like this. So she promised that she wouldn't do it anymore. And they said, fine, you know, you're not allowed to, to cook for people, not allowed to serve people anymore. And so she was okay for a little bit. And then she started breaking the rules and started serving people. And then people started dying again. And yeah, this is a real story. So that's typhoid Mary. If you haven't heard about typhoid Mary, she went around spreading her disease. And so if I ever call you typhoid Mary, I think you're spreading disease to people. I'd say it a lot, actually. So that's the idea with that. Um, so there's all these different kinds of carriers that you can have associated with uh, spreading of disease. And so I would be aware of these different carrier states that you can have, whether it is asymptomatic or um, convalescent. So you're recovering, which is what I was just talking to you guys about. Um, you are recuperating, but you're still going on to pass the symptoms on um, because you're not, you haven't completely gotten rid of the infection, right? And et cetera. So that's the idea here. All right, living reservoirs. These are going to include animals. Um, yeah, and they can be the... The pathogens that are transmitted by animals can be directly transmitted to humans or via vectors um, or even through water or other vehicles. Actively ill people, of course, can transmit infection. We have indirect transmission uh, where I, it's a fomite basically. So you touch a, a surface and that's the term for it. Um, like this pen, I put this in my mouth, I, uh, I lick it all over and I hand it to you and you grab it. And now you have my germs and you can get whatever COVID I have, right? So that is indirect transmission, of course. And then direct is like, if I sneeze directly in your face. Obviously that's gross and um, could transmit things. So other human um, carriers, we have people who are recovered, but are still shedding. Um, and then we have people who are uh, incubators um, that are carriers of certain diseases that they just don't know that they are infected because they don't have any symptoms and they could still be spreading around that disease associated with that. We also have transmission links to um, insects that bite and drink your blood. So arthropod vectors, that's gonna include anything that does that. So uh, insects that bite you and drink your blood and can transmit disease are arthropod vectors. This includes mosquitoes and ticks and fleas. So this is, um, they can be the host for it. So they can actually get sick from these pathogens or they can just be the means of transmission. So they aren't always infected, but sometimes they can be. Right, in epidemiology, a uh, live animal that transmits an infectious agent from one host to another is known as a vector. There are biological and mechanical vectors. Biological vectors actually actively get infected with this thing, whereas a mechanical vector, they just transmit it. So biological and um Biological vectors are infected like um, chickens or other birds when we're talking about like bird flu, right? So they're actually infected with the virus. 
However, we have mechanical vectors that these guys just walked over some poopy or something. And now they're going to walk over your food. And now you've got poopy food. So that's the idea with that. That's a mechanical vector. So that's the difference there. A zoonosis is the spread of a disease from animals to humans, essentially. Humans typically in this case are going to be dead end hosts and that disease can't be actually maintained in the human population most of the time when we're talking about zoonoses. Um, it's usually at first associated with close, um, close associations with animals and people who are involved in outdoor work usually are most likely to be infected. This will include things like rabies, um, hantavirus, uh, West Nile virus, anthrax, plague, ringworm, toxoplasmosis, and tapeworm. Maybe some of those are surprising to you to hear, but no, um, a lot of these are maintained in animal populations. So here are some diseases that are zoonotic infections that you could be aware of are from animals. We already know rabies is, that's an obvious one. We know the plague is because rodents are going to be maintaining it in their population. And then the vectors that are moving it from the rodents to people would be um, the fleas. And so that's, you know, the black plague. Um, and then we can go on for a lot of these things, but you guys get it. So our non-living reservoirs, this is just areas where you could have gotten sick from something that isn't an alive um, area. So what I'm trying to say, so like from the soil, for example. So if you are outside and you step on a nail and you go to the doctor and you're like, oh, I stepped on this nail. Can you check it out? And they're like, yeah, here's your tetanus shot. Why are they giving you a tetanus shot? That's because that's an organism. That's a microbe that lives in a soil as an endospore. It exists in the soil potentially that you could be introducing into the insides of your body and um, clostridium um, tetani that would get you sick potentially, right? A lot of these are going to be um, op opportunistic path pathogens. So they're just waiting for your immune system to be weakened so that they can take advantage of you. So, all right, uh, communicable disease is whenever an infected host can transmit an infection uh, from um, one to another. So it can be, you know, moved, transferred. Uh, contagious refers to highly communicable, especially through direct contact. And then non communicable, we are not going to be able to transmit it from host to host. It's like if you fall down, you skin your knee and you don't clean it up and it gets infected, that's non-communicable. That is a disease, that is an infection, it is non-communicable. All right, horizontal transmission is spread of the infection through a population from one person to another that can be direct or it can be indirect, which we've talked about already, or due to vector transmission. Um, vertical transmission is transmitting from the parent to the offspring. So this could just be um, transmitted by the sperm during conception. It could be, or the ovum, uh, or it could be across the placenta or in the breast milk or during, you know, during birth and stuff like that. So and any sort of transmission where you have a vehicle involved is where um, we have an inanimate object like the pen that I licked earlier that um, is inanimate and is allowing us to transfer from one location to the next. So one, one host to the next host, and it's acting as a vehicle for that. That inanimate object that we did that with, I licked my pen and gave it to you and you grabbed it and got my COVID, that is called a fomite. So it's not a continuous source of infection. It's not like you can always rely on this pen to always have COVID forever. No, that's a continue. that would be a continuous. This is not that. It is a fomite that is um, temporarily transmitting, um, acting as a vehicle for that disease. And we also have the oral fecal route, which is pretty straightforward. I'm not sure I really have to tell you about it. You don't wash your hands and you spread your disease. Um, water and soil can also cause people to get sick. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's why we look for fecal coliforms in our water whenever we are treating it. Yes. Um, also the air that can serve as a, a transport medium for certain pathogens that some things can hang in the air for a lot longer than you might think. So that's um, something to be aware of as well. Droplet nuclei, this, these are um, dried, sorry, these are dried microscopic uh, residues um, from, of, of mucus and saliva that are ejected from the nose and the mouth. Um, and then we have aerosols that themselves are suspensions of fine dust or moisture particles um, in the air that can contain live pathogens as well. So those are, those are different things, droplet nuclei versus aerosols. Koch's postulates, this is just to determine the causative agent of some sort of infection. So this is the standard 
or the sort of a thing it deter he determined the cause of anthrax. And this is just a series of steps, a series of proofs that allows you to determine the cause of a thing. So you have a thing, you have a sample from somebody who's sick and you played it out and you determined that, okay, um, when I look at these samples, um, we're going to try looking at the red, the red cells first, I don't know, the red colonies first or whatever they look like such and such under the microscope or whatever. So you have a reason to isolate that organism. Now we've isolated that organism. We can put it into a host like a mouse in this case and inoculate it. And if it is going to show the same symptoms, the same effects as the original one did up here, then um, we will go ahead and re-isolate that same agent. Hopefully it's the same agent. If it is in fact the same agent from that original source that we got way up here, if it is the same on this end step from the mouse that you just killed from the sample that you acquired from the original guy, that confirms the cause of that disease. So that's Koch's postulates. Um, they rely, nowadays we rely on advanced molecular biology. So that would be a molecular version of Koch's postulates. Obviously we can look at genetics and PCR to determine the identity of certain things and the relatedness and the cause of those. So this is the end of the chapter. And I want you guys to give me an example of a syndrome. And I already gave you one example, but try to give me a different one if you can, um, and list associated signs and symptoms for that syndrome. And that is it for this chapter. And I will see you guys next time.